Brooklyn Independent Television. Hello, welcome to Neighborhood Beat, your passport to Brooklyn. I'm your host, Aaron Watkins, and today we're back in beautiful Bushwick, Brooklyn. In this episode, we'll view the graceful works of artist Tim Oskimura and learn about hydroponic farming with Lee Mandel of Bosvik Farms. Next, we'll watch the making of homeopathic remedies from herbalist Anit Hura. And finally, we'll sample delicious Venezuelan fare at Guacuco on Irving Avenue. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hey, who says you have to leave the neighborhood in order to get yourself ready for a night out on the town? Here are a few ways that you can pamper yourself while still supporting the local economy. You can start your search for the perfect outfit at Nouveau View. They have a great selection of vintage clothing and accessories. You can also get one-of-a-kind leather-made goods and unique jewelry by making an appointment at the Countercore with designer CC. Freshen up your style with an edgy cut from Tomahawk Salon. And finally, you can stop by Gotham City Lounge, an old school local watering hole with a great collection of comic book memorabilia. So do it up big Bushwick style. I promise you won't be disappointed. Based in Brooklyn, Tim Oshimura is a painter known for his portraits, most of which are set in an urban backdrop. Tim combines graffiti and realism. The result being, quite frankly, some amazingly beautiful art. My name is Tim Okamura and I'm a painter working here in beautiful Bushwick, Brooklyn. I work primarily on what I've always referred to as urban portraiture and sometimes the work veered more off into uh, uh, narrative scenarios but uh, most often it focuses on, on portraiture with uh, graffiti elements and urban motifs that sort of complement the sitter you know, in a psychological way. You know, the environmental experience of Brooklyn is very unique and that I am, as I said, primarily inspired by the people of Brooklyn, but there's a synergy between them and, and the environment. I think they complement each other. There's something that has a lot of psychological ramifications for me when I walk down the street and I see the layering of graffiti. I sort of consider it an urban, organic experience the layering of graffiti, the layering of posters, and the kind of urban decay that you encounter in some places. I think most people find at first glance to be a negative, but I, I find a lot of beauty and, and vibrance in that. I like to juxtapose that with the people living in proximity to those kinds of motifs that I think are interesting, and there's an interplay between the two that is really uh, fascinating for me. I've had two solo exhibitions, and have moved a lot of paintings out of the studio in that time, so I'm in a development phase right now where uh, there's a lot of work in progress. It's actually a painting of uh, three friends of mine who are in a show, How to Make in America. It's just the canvas tacked to the wall. As opposed to this painting, which is uh, stretched and has been shown um, at an exhibit celebrating uh, the creation of Ralph McDaniels. I really wanted to have an old school feeling, the old gazelles and the door knocker earrings. And something really important to me in the work is always infusing positive message. In the case of butterflies, which has been a real favorite motif of mine recently because of the metaphor of metamorphosis and change. As a contrast to this uh, piece, which is for museum show, I have another piece I'd like to show you, which is actually a commission painting uh, that I'm having a lot of fun working on. I, I don't do a lot of commission paintings. Clients wanted a painting with uh, a theme of Jamaica. Yeah, I was intrigued by the idea of, of working with this really, really graphic flag in behind, and this is just a work in progress. I'm also working on two other paintings which uh, are a little bit of a different direction for me. Uh, that's presenting a challenge, but also uh, 
uh, I'm pretty excited about them, and they're doing a the theme of boxing. These are some new portraits that I've been working on that are dealing with uh, women portrayed as boxers and the models that I chose for this I think beautiful and delicate <laughs> so the, the contrast of these these masks really interested me my history in Brooklyn is uh, mostly driven by economics and being an artist looking for space for cheap <laughs> me and a few other artists moved to Dumbo before Dumbo was Dumbo. It was all very industrial. Eventually, uh, we ended up moving to Williamsburg, and again, you know, felt like pioneers. Like, Williamsburg was largely abandoned buildings. So I saw the gentrification happen, you know, right before my eyes. Basically, I got displaced, <laughs> you know, like, so in search of space, again, at a, at a more affordable price, uh, I moved further out on the on the L train to Bushwick and um, now I'm seeing the beginnings of gentrification happening here as well. It seems like artists are always that that initial seed that gets sown in in neighborhoods and and really we're happy I think you know, just to you know find our little space and just do our work and that's it. I, I never moved to Bushwick looking to change the neighborhood and I think that the gentrification process has begun, but for the most part, this neighborhood has been a little more stable in terms of a lot of um, Latin families in this neighborhood that uh, do own their own buildings. And I think that that's been a strength of it. My artistic process has become actually harder and harder to describe in, in a sense. I mean, I have a general idea a lot of times of, of what I want to do or who I want to paint, but it's become very organic in that sometimes I'll just start the portrait and not know what background or what environment is going to envelop that person or interact with that person until I'm halfway through the painting. So I, I've been a lot more open, I think, to spontaneous decisions and really sometimes waiting for that moment of inspiration where I, I get a sense of what needs to happen in the painting to support that person's personality or psychology. The planning stages are very basic for me in that I, I know the model that I want to work with and maybe have a general sense of what I want to do, but a lot of time I just go into it with uh, an open-ended, you know, uh, feeling of, of where it might go. And um, for me, that's where, that's where the excitement comes a lot of times, is that I know there's going to be a certain amount of work in developing and, and uh, getting into the detail in certain areas, but those moments where I'm like, you know, I'm gonna do this in the background really spontaneous with uh, spray paint, that's the fun for me. So not knowing exactly what's gonna happen or when it's gonna happen is, is where I get uh, some energy and excitement from. Bushwick has some really amazing places to chow down. Here are a few of my favorite spots. Check out Momo Sushi Sack for Japanese tapas on Bogart Street. Then there's Verde Cold Pizza on Irving Avenue. The pizza here is amazing. For something sweet, go to Chirko's Pastry Stop. They've been in the neighborhood for generations. And then stop in for a great glass of wine from Bodega Wine Bar on St. Nicholas Avenue. If you live in the neighborhood, lucky you. And if you don't, well, it's definitely worth a visit. Let's explore growing fresh tomatoes in your living room. Or how about picking succulent peppers from the vines in your kitchen? Sounds like maple leaf? Well, it's not. What it is is Bosvik Farms in Bushwick, a place that puts folks like you in charge of their own produce by empowering you with the knowledge and tools to make them grow. I'm excited too. Let's check it out. Hello. It's a neighborhood beat. Bushwick has a very, very long history. It was originally settled in the 1630s and was farmland for a long, long time. And we feel that that historical connection is very important. 
My background originally is in computer science. Uh, I was a computer programmer for many, many years. I then moved to Brooklyn, and within a year, I had read a magazine article about vertical farming, the idea of you know, a 40-story tall building that's just a farm, and it was all hydroponics. And I got very interested in it. And then I visited a place called the Science Barge, which is on the Hudson River. It is a teaching hydroponic greenhouse and when I walked off of that, I told myself, this is what I want to do, even though I didn't know exactly what, what this meant. And that was really the beginning of it all. Basically, what hydroponics is, it's a different way of feeding the roots. Instead of roots being in soil, they're either in some sort of media or hanging in the air or right in water and all of the nutrients that the plants get are mixed into a solution that is circulated through the roots. Ironically, one of the benefits of hydroponic farming is that it uses 70 to 90 percent less water. It's also very space efficient. You can get anywhere from two to three times the production per square foot, and especially here in a dense urban environment, that is a really important thing. The space that we're in right now is our main indoor research and development space. We have lettuce and peppers and basil growing in here, and the roots are literally growing right into the water and nutrient solution. At the bottom, we have a reservoir that keeps all of the nutrients. It pumps all the way up to the top, then overflows to the middle, and then down to the bottom, and then recirculates right down back into the reservoir. The fact that it's recirculating is what causes hydroponics to be so water efficient. There's no runoff and there's very little evaporation. So what we have here is an experiment where we're looking at two different types of lighting systems. We're working with a local company who is developing this LED light and we're trying to see how they compare. We're always playing around with these different systems, seeing what works well, seeing what doesn't work well, and that way when we're out in the field and installing things, we have much more confidence in what we're installing. So what we have right here is an example of an aeroponic system. And aeroponics is a type of hydroponics where the root zone of the plants, as you can see right here, gets fed from underneath or from the sides. They get sprayed with the mist. There are actually about six different types of hydroponic systems. And you can actually see most of them in operation here, and certainly the ones that we don't have, we have over on our rooftop. The rooftop farm that you're seeing here is part of a theater called the Bushwick Star. I have done theater work in the past, and I've done work here at the Star. And three years ago, they asked, would we be interested in setting some systems up on the rooftop? Um, and after virtually no hesitation, the answer was yes. Uh, the first year, we had just a few systems up here. We took a little bit of the roof. Uh, the second year, we probably had half of it. And now we've really maximized the space here. Um, they have been very generous. Uh, the folks at the Bushwick Star are wonderful and it's really been a collaboration. I'm a sculptor, Chloe does theater work, Alex Middleton is a guitar player. So we all have artistic talents and we express it through the farm as well so that dovetails with the Bushwick Star perfectly. That connection with the Bushwick Star Theater has been really great to show literally the coexistence of farming and the arts. I think that artists are very, very comfortable with making creative solutions to any type of problem. And so it seems really natural to me that artists are also interested in things like urban agriculture and sustainability because we really have learned that without creative solutions, we're not really going to succeed as a nation. The goals of Bosbike Farms are really in two directions, although the core of both of them is education. One is that we work in schools and we're looking to teach science in a very different way. And the second thing that we do is we work with social service providers. Growing can be very therapeutic. 
So we're working with senior centers and with organizations that work with people with mental and physical disabilities. And we're also working in soup kitchens and food pantries to bring the highest quality food to people who don't usually have access to it. This year especially has been a, a real year of expansion for the farm. Our revenues are increasing, we've been getting into many more schools and more social service providers. So this is really the big year for us. Our certification program, which was one of only two in the country, is also going to have a big impact over the next year because we're going to be training people that can then go out and work in the urban farming movement here. There's a 100,000 square foot greenhouse that's going to be all hydroponic down in Sunset Park and they're going to need employees. It's very important to us when we work with our clients that we work with them and teach them how to grow as opposed to just coming in, building a system and maintaining it and giving them the food. Um, we really want to empower people to take control of their food. And that really is something that guides us. Resident Anit Hora has created a healing oasis in the urban jungle with her line of handmade herbal products. She founded Moulin and Sparrow from her Bushwick apartment and began creating and selling her concoctions at the loom. Now, let's meet the woman behind the magic. My name is Anit Hora and I'm an herbalist and I'm also the founder of Mullen and Sparrow, a small herbal apothecary line that's based right here in Brooklyn. Mullen is the first herb that I ever learned in herb class. And mullen is actually really, really good if you have asthma or anything like that. And Sparrow, it's like a small, tiny bird and my family always tells me that I remind them of that. So it, that's kind of just like a cheesy personal touch that I added. For many years, I was a fashion designer and I worked a lot of hours and I just realized that it wasn't making me happy. So one day I just quit my job and I went to South America. I ended up staying there for a year. I just backpacked by myself and when I came back, I realized I just never wanted to work in an office again. I just want people to just open their minds a little bit more to what herbal products are. We're not just one genre of like hippies that you know, use this. It's everyone. This used to be everyone's medicine and I kind of want it to be everyone's medicine again. So I'm going to show you how to make a sugar scrub today. Every time the seasons change, it's a great way to exfoliate your skin. You're going to get some sugar. It can be white sugar, it can be brown sugar. Just make sure it's not powdered sugar because we do want the grain to exfoliate. I have about four ounces. Since I have four ounces of sugar, I have half the amount of oil. This is almond oil. And it's really good for your skin. You can choose any essential oil that you like, but I'm using lavender today. Then I just have a container that I'm going to use to store this. We're going to take the oil and mix it in slowly. Some people like a lot of grit and some people don't like so much. Pour about half that. Stir it around. Don't put too much oil. It should still have its grit, but I'm just gonna put it in. I do like the moisturizing um, aspect of having this much oil in my scrub. I'm gonna take my lavender essential oil. I'm gonna put a few drops in at a time. Just stir it up a little bit. So now I'm just gonna smell it. And uh, now here it is. This is the perfect smell. Just take this and we're just gonna spoon this mixture right in there. And this is perfect. So now I'm just gonna cap this up. You have your very own homemade sugar scrub. An apothecary is just a place where you can get your medicine. They would like compound it for you. And if you have, let's say you went and you're like, I have really dry skin and the guy would make you your own cream. I wanna have that like that handmade feeling to everything. So you feel like it's, it's coming from another time where people still cared about what stuff was and they had a lot of pride in what they made um, with their own hands.
So the Mullen and Sparrow line currently has 25 products in it and we're adding a, a few more. The first thing that I'm going to show you is the Serene Tea Blend. This is a very nice tea blend for after dinner, calms down your stomach. I'm going to show you what's inside so you can see. It has lavender, chamomile and fennel and they smell really good too. The second thing is the Lavender Hydrosol and this is pure distilled lavender water. It has a few drops of essential oil in it. Just spray this. You can spray it in a room. You can, I'm going to spray some on myself. Very calming and healing for your skin. Um, you can spray it on your pillow at night. It's, um, this is one of my favorite products in the line right now. And the last thing are the bath salts. They're really good at detoxing. And they actually have the, the dried herbs in them. And that's what I'm using for the aromatherapy. I'm not adding anything extra. And um, they're very effective. I've been living in Bushwick for about four years now. I moved here um, right after I came back from South America. I was living in Williamsburg before, but just in a span of a little over a year, it changed so much that when I came back, I didn't recognize it. A lot of my friends that live here are artists or they all create something, and I really like being part of that. It's very neighborhoody. like everybody here knows everybody. It's, very, it's still very small. I would like to be in some more stores just because I would like the stability of that. It just makes me happy to be able to do something like this and do it um, on my own terms. You can find Mullen and Sparrow products at mullenandsparrow.com. Um, I also have an Etsy store for people who are more interested in that. I also sell in a few stores in Brooklyn and you can find all of those on my stockist page on my website. As Bushwick becomes more diverse, so do the food offerings. Recently, we had a taste for Venezuelan cuisine and Leonardo Molina at Guacuco answered the call. My name is Leonardo Molina. We're in Bushwick, Brooklyn. We're at Arepera, Guacuco. Arepera means a place that sells arepas, and Guacuco, it's a beach in Margarita Island. Arepas are made out of 100% corn flour. They're totally gluten-free. They can range from shredded beef to vegan options, anything you want in there. I really like the plantains. I love the rice and beans, always. And the vegetariano, which I just ordered, is quite delicious. The, the reason why I chose um, Bushwick, I saw a lot of the changes that was coming into the neighborhood. When it's working, it's getting too expensive. Bushwick is like the outskirts of everything, pretty much, that's going on. The rent. Yeah, it's not as expensive as the city. I like the people here, it's young, crowds, family members coming here. Every kind of person comes in here, and I like it. I'm gonna show you how to make the arepas. So we are in the kitchen with Leonardo, and he's gonna show us how to prepare one of the must-have dishes, the arepas. We're gonna grab some of the masa, just a little bit of water, and salt to prepare the masa. Now, we're just gonna kind of like... Okay, now it's starting to flatten a little bit? Yeah. So where did you get the recipe for your arepas? What's better than mom's cooking? So yeah, so, yeah. It's all my mom's recipes over here. Thanks, mom. <laughs> it's like, really? Thanks, mom. For our arepas over here. We need these arepas to sit for like at least six minutes. It'll get like a nice crunchy part to it. And then we put them in the oven. Want arepa? We always just let this arepa sit in there about for like seven minutes. Sounds good to me. Now we're gonna take our arepas out, leave it in the oven for about approximately eight, ten minutes. Oh, that's beautiful. So one way to know if our arepas are ready, kind of smack them. I notice that it makes, it's ready to go. Clean your rags over here. And so now we're ready to fill them up. Take a knife. Now we're gonna cut them in half, nice and half fresh out of the oven. We're gonna put these sweet plantains. We're gonna throw about three pieces of the sweet plantains inside the arepa. We're gonna top it off with white, salty Venezuelan cheese. So you have the sweetness and you have the salty cheese in there, okay? For meals, like in your hand. Shredded beef. That baby up right there. These are our, our black beans. And now we're gonna top that off with white Venezuelan cheese as well. 
We actually got this cheese all the way from Miami. I'm just over here salivating just like you, my friends. That thing looks absolutely fantastic. So you'll be the judge. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. I want to just make sure you get a good view of just this, this beautiful arepa. make a vegetarian arepa, okay? So this is my arepa, and we're just gonna cut it in half here. And we're scooping the inside out. Start with the plantain. We're gonna put some of that white Venezuelan Guayanes cheese. Guayanes? Guayanes. Okay. Slice of fresh tomato right there as well. Mmm. Yeah. Slice of avocado. Now, you have your arepa vegetariana. Vegetariana. Correct. Oh. Delicious. Healthy living, healthy eating in Bushwick. Mmm. Coconut shake. It's made of um, coconut milk. It has real coconut flakes in it. Now those arepas were absolutely fantastic. But you know when you finish your meal and you don't want to leave just yet, and sometimes you want to linger? The mess, we definitely get a coconut shake. Let's see how uh, that's done. We take the, the, ma the magical mix over here. We pour it in with a little bit of ice. Put it into the blender. These are the real coconut flakes. Okay. A touch of vanilla as well. We blend that for about 40 seconds, 60 seconds maybe. And this is the texture that I actually like it in. Oh yeah. A touch of cinnamon. What a great meal. What a fantastic way to end it off. You know, the machines just going, I'm like, oh yes. You know, I grew up on the, you know, the Frosties and the, you know, chocolate, vanilla, uh, you know, shakes, things like that. But coconut seems a little more authentic, you know, as a as an adult, I can go and have a great meal and I can order this shake and it um, works out perfect. Oh, we okay. stopping by every weekend. <laughs> Just as good as you think it is at home. I highly suggest you come on down, try the arepas, make sure you get yourself a coconut shake. This is great, man. I Thank love you. it. Appreciate it. Well, that does it for this episode of Neighborhood Beat. I hope my little visit today will inspire you to get out and check out this fantastic neighborhood for yourself. To learn more about us, you can visit us at brickartsmedia.org slash B-I-T. You can also download episodes on iTunes, friend us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. Keyword, BK Independent TV. Stay strong, Brooklyn. We love you. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.